well uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, event on psychiatric rehabilitation clinical issues and challenges uh, which is organized by the bombay psychiatric society on the behalf of bombay psychiatric society and my entire executive committee team i welcome all of you to this event uh, the reason we thought of this event primarily was because psychiatric rehabilitation has taken a few hits there have been ups and downs during the covid pandemic even prior to that it was a topic which a uh, few people who were working in that area had interest in uh, many clinicians like me who have a purely opd practice have had patients ask them that you know we would want a day care service we would want a long term facility we would want a short term facility and uh, we've had very few centers to choose from and apart from that uh, uh, we really ourselves being only in an office based practice have no idea about what happens in the centers though i mean the results are beautiful in many cases but so we thought it would be good for clinicians to have an idea of the work being done not only in our city but extending it to maharashtra and of course india as well so we have speakers not only from the city we have speakers from the state we have speakers from out of maharashtra also who are going to address us today um the program is divided into two parts the first part uh, three parts the first part will look at day care centers the second part the second part will look at inpatient uh, rehabilitation uh, the third part will look at long term rehabilitation and legal issues which was to be taken up by dr kumawat but due to certain uh, reasons dr kumawat isn't able to join us today so we won't have that lecture we'll probably get that to you at another date another time if we can definitely manage that uh to start with it's uh, my what we would do is once the two speakers the first two speakers dr fabian and dr anita finish presenting we'll have questions on day care addressed to them so that it won't be just people speaking for a long time following that we'll have two more speakers and then questions addressed to them and then finally uh, dr kalyan sundram and questions thereafter and any other general questions that the audience might want to ask at that point of time uh it's my proud privilege honor to introduce our speakers for the first session uh starting first with of course dr fabian almeida he's a consultant psychiatrist runs his private practice at uh kalyan and he's also attached to the fortis hospital uh in that area uh fabian runs the well springs mental health center which does a lot of work in mental health he's also famous for his work in school mental health and the overnight teachers training program that he does every year famous for the mental health calendar which he brings out every year which is also an another innovative thing uh what's also important about fabian is he's of course a part of bombay psychiatric society he's a part of our executive committee he's always available when we need him uh, he's our most dependable person go to person when we need him for anything uh well i missed out being a co resident with him by i think a year and a half or two years so that was my bad luck but luckily the good luck is that i get to work with him as a consultant so that's fabian almeida for you and our second speaker today is dr anita sukwani uh dr anita sukwani has been the past president my predecessor in bombay psychiatric society i had an excellent year working with her and we did a plethora of programs while she was the president and i think that set the tone for this year and we're doing a large number of programs this year as well uh madam runs a center called man which is a day care center that does its own unique work with mental health uh she of course has always been interested in psychiatric rehab uh, for a long time so uh she and fabian are our two opening speakers so fabian will start with challenges in setting up a day care center and then madam would talk about her experiences in her day care center you would probably speak for around 20 to 25 minutes each and then once both of you finish speaking we'll have questions over to you fabian yeah yes thank you avinash for your pleasant words of introduction you have the gift of making everyone feel very special thank you i'll sh start by sharing my screen so fine that's it i uh thought of calling this part of my presentation the decoding of the daycare experience i was lucky enough to have my daycare running for about 10 years now and what i have experienced 
the challenges, the highs, the lows, is what I've put forth in this presentation. And therefore I've titled it, Decoding the Decay Experience. Well, we realize that when you say yes to psychiatry, you have said yes to challenges. And whether it is the speciality where very often we have to keep explaining to our patients and their caregivers, the what, the why, the how, whether it is diagnosis, whether it is treatment, medications, whether it is compliance, everything seems to be a challenge. And therefore, we are well-suited and well-trained for challenges right from day one when we step into psychiatry. And then when we move on to our private practice or things like this, I think those challenges that come our way make us stronger and better. Well, it was humble beginnings for me when I thought about the daycare concept for myself. I remember I had attended the psychosocial conference at Nimhans in Bangalore. And I was very taken up by one of the speakers who had come from the US of A. And the emphasis at that time in 2010, where a lot of it in that session was about shorter hospital stays, halfway homes, patient-centric processes. And I thought it was time that I ventured into something like this to bring about a different aspect of treatment to my patients who I deal with. And then I did some amount of groundwork as well. I made it a point and I was lucky at then to visit Dr. Kalyan Sundram as well. I had the uh, beautiful opportunity to see the Richmond Foundation and have Sir explain to me what they do, how they do their courses, et cetera. And it was uh, really very nice to be able to understand all of that, what was going on at the Richmond Foundation my good friend, Dr. Advet Padye, who also had a setup on the same lines, and my also another good friend in Goa, Dr. Peter Castellino. And I remember uh, staying a few days in Goa, enjoying Goan hospitality, as well as going through the motions as to what and how of the daycare center that was run there. And I felt a sense of inspiration and inclination towards moving with this aspect of treatment for our patients, bringing in a little innovation. And that's when on the 6th of July, 2010, is when I started my daycare center, Hope Springs. And though, so I say, it is the I factor that becomes important when you want to take something like this ahead. It is the inspiration that you get from people around you. It is the inclination that you have within you to want to do something of this aspect for your patient and caregivers. And of course, the innovation that you want to try and apply to aspects of treatment that is offered to both the patient and the caregiver. Starting from there, our journey then, we realized that the beginning, the most important aspect as we began taking in patients was the paperwork. We needed to have our paperwork in place which had details about the patient diagnosis, maybe a provisional diagnosis to begin with, the phone numbers that were important in case of any emergencies to contact, uh, what pluses and minuses of the patient that we need to keep in mind, and including payment details, because these were aspects that had to be in one place available for any scrutiny at any point of time further, or for us to go back to when required. So. The paperwork is something that is important. It must be filled properly and checked and cross-checked as well by the person in charge of the daycare because ultimately the responsibility lies upon you. So I was keen that paperwork had to be in place as we go ahead. It was also important to make sure we have the briefing of the staff when we have patients come in. Now in an OPD setup, we realize Patients come and go, our receptionists and few of our assistants deal with them for a, a couple of hours, less than an hour properly per patient. But when you talk about a daycare aspect, they are more involved and it's probably on a continued basis. Therefore, sensitizing our staff to mental health aspects, uh, this is also the people who are not professionally from the mental health field. So, our class four uh, people who are there 
it was important to sensitize them also what was bipolar, how would an addictive patient feel or could be uneasy if he had some aspects of withdrawal that he could be experiencing at that point of time. All of these aspects were brought into the fold with our staff. And every week before we started taking in for the Monday, for the beginning of the week, we would spend at least half an hour to 45 minutes outlining who we were to receive that week, what do we need to keep in mind, and probably what were our treatment goals as we went ahead with those patients. So, <coughs> sorry, I believe briefing your staff is an important aspect at the start of the journey every week when you take in your patients and you start a new week dedicated to them. Once you receive your patients, the group that you, and we would work in small numbers, we would work with groups of five, eight, 10, or maximum 12. But we would need to understand that they come from different backgrounds, they have different sets of problems, and the symptomology could be varied. Of course, all of them had to be in the mild to moderate range so that they could function in a decade without being having problems for themselves or for others. Having passed that muster, then breaking the ice among them was also important. So some games sometimes, the routine introductions that would be there, this would be important to make sure people got to know each other and age, education, status, etc., was not something that was a part of the definition that was required to be part of this decade. As of all, we made people understand we are all in on the same page, we are all in the same boat because we have problems which are related to our mind, we are seeking solutions, and this journey is what we are making together. So nobody is better, nobody is worse, Nobody is in any way different. We are all making this journey together. Breaking that ice was important to bring people on par with each other in the group that we set. It was also important to then get them gradually in their comfort zone. We realized then when our patients are in their comfort zone, they are able to take in much more. They are able to absorb so much more. They are able to give back so much more. And gradually, this probably would not happen on the first day or the second day itself. It would take a little time, but we would realize, as we know, that some would get into the flow very easily and some would have more difficulty. We would tend to spend a little more time before or after the day care to help people fit into the comfort zone easier. This is something that we need to pick up while we are interacting with the people at the day care and also probably address the reasons why they may not be in that comfort zone. Sometimes it could be ignorance, sometimes it could be based on fears that need the myths that need to be busted. And on the whole, addressing those aspects and helping them move towards their comfort zone is again a step in the right direction. Yes. With all the activities that we had, and uh, Dr. Anita Sukwani is going to throw more light on all of this, it was important to get them engaged into the activity so that time was not difficult for them to pass through from morning to the few hours that we would continue the daycare. It probably at the beginning, it could be cumbersome for them. It could be difficult for them to give their attention, concentration, and involvement in the programs that were there. But eventually, Picking up activities and having a schedule for the day is something that is important to keep them engaged. And also having the probably the more cognitive aspects of a program, the ones which are more challenging in the earlier half of your daycare schedule, having the more active and easier ones, maybe post lunch or when you expect them to be a little lethargic or have an end of the day syndrome, these are something you keep in mind as you outline what could be best to engage your patients? Now, when your patients are engaged, it is also important that we are involved with our patients. Sometimes it could be that we could give them a task and leave them to their completion and come back to them later after the task to check on what's happened. Now, this may not be the best way possible. And therefore, it was important for us again to sensitize 
our staff that we need to have involvement during a task, supporting them, encouraging them, appreciating them, or if something went wrong, reassuring them that they can reach the task to completion. Perfection was never the goal of any task that was taken at that point of time. Participation was more important and helping them participate together was again the onus of the staff. It is sometimes a distraction that the staff may get back to their WhatsApp or their conversations between them, which was something that I would strictly not allow. When the staff is with our people at the daycare, they need to be wholesomely involved in everything that's happening. So phones had to be aside and even personal conversations had to be kept aside. Conversations with the patients and among them was to be encouraged to even foster bonding and stability. So engagement, uh, making sure the patients are doing something they like and they get involved with what is happening. We as the staff are also involved with them during the task and appreciation and reassurance that helps take a task to completion. Using creativity wherever you can is something that spices up the process of the daycare activities. So it, probably the ideas may not have been only ours. We could depend on other people of our staff who would come up with creative ideas. We were always open to ideas even from our patients, but that spark of creativity is something that is required to prevent us from getting into the mundane or the routine, which happens quite often sometimes because you run off a schedule and you move and you want to move according to that schedule. But sometimes it could be a tough day. Sometimes the weather doesn't get the better of you. You want to change and there is always an openness to change the day, uh, activity for the day to get better participation, but nevertheless, looking at creative options and trying to do probably the same things in a different manner or trying what other people are doing. So being aware of what's happening around, being open to newer aspects of activities for patient engagement is also some way in which creativity can be enhanced at the daycare center. And whatever creati creativity is what you get through through the patients is always best showcased and kept along to make others also feel the urge to be creative, to inspire and to tickle other people's creativity uh, thoughts, processes that are important. So when something good or creative comes across from the patient participation that's happening, make it a point to either take a photograph and keep it on display or keep that particular art or craft activity or something else also on display. It also helps the patient feel good about what they are doing. At the same time, it displays the creative process that your daycare center is up to. Yes, reflections that are important. At certain times during each day or even during the week, it is important to take some time off to pause and reflect on what is being uh, conducted, what is being doing, uh, done, and how we are benefiting from the process. I remember a beautiful post put by our very own Dr. Avinash D'Souza on the Facebook, practice the pause. And that is so much a reality for life and for our daycare centers as well. So at some times, we need to make sure that things are taken uh, in the silent zone, they are restful, they are calm, and they reflect on what they are doing and why they are doing. Those reflections, can be eye openers both for the patient and for us who are working with the patients. So when you come through these reflections, when some things come through these, it is important to also note it down and use it for the next consultation you have with your patient or the next follow-up when you have to bring those points to the fore. People who have a guilt process that's on or some other uh, thought process of childhood or uh, during their sharings or discussions, their weakness that they have shared is something that could be noted and kept in mind to bring about at the next consultation of follow-up. These reflections and these pauses are also valuable. This journey in the decay, now whether it could be five days for someone, 10 days or 15 days, depending on 
how much we would recommend it for a patient. It is a journey of self-discovery as well. We need to help the patient discover more about themselves, their strengths, their weaknesses, what opportunities they have at hand and how they can make their journey ahead better. <coughs> Self-worth has to be enhanced and therefore that directly helps them to have a sense of better self-esteem, which is so important for our psychiatric patients and their psychiatric symptomology. And self-love, the fact that they need to care for themselves as well. This is important with the patient as well as with the caregiver. So when we would have caregiver meets as an offshoot of the daycare process, self-love is not selfish, is something that was always elaborated. Helping them with small exercises to understand these aspects are parts of this journey which are very vital during the few days that you may have of the patient at your daycare. The self-discovery, the self-worth, and the self-love that we initiate through various processes. Emotional hygiene, the ability for people to recognize their own emotions, to be able to express and communicate the same, and to be able to bring about what is happening in others is also an important aspect of their journey in the daycare. I remember having the outline of the Navrasas, having them pick up pictures relating to different aspects of the emotions that are there, discuss and bring about a certain sense of comfort with their own emotions. And this emotional hygiene serves in the long run to help reduce the relapses that could happen and the remission rate, which is be leads better towards recovery. So emotional hygiene in various forms of exercises, discussions, in whatever way possible, a patient who comes into the daycare should be able to go back with a better sense and understanding of emotional hygiene. Balance spirituality. And this becomes important because it's also a very volatile place for people to have discussions, whether it is uh, uh, politics or whether it is majority, minority, religious uh, attributes and rituals, you need to keep things balanced. And in our balanced spirituality, it was more not towards rituals or, or religions, it was more towards a sense of acceptance of a higher being. We would also read religious books of all different faiths that were kept there, understand what the common thread in every, uh, in every spiritual aspect that every, every form of religion has, and the ability to develop a sense of tolerance when we talk about each other's religion. So this was kept also at balance because sometimes our patients, the spirituality symptom could be cause or consequence of their mental health problems as well. Skill building. If you see particular skills, help them to build it further. We need to give them guidance, how to help that skill to be of use for them as they go ahead with their recovery process and reintegration into society. Also some basic things that you could teach for people for whom it could even become a way of life. We often uh, educated them about simple tasks like paper bag making, which definitely is an exercise in coordination, attention, et cetera. But for some of them, they went back and learned to make paper bags and sold it every week and got some amount of money that could come through whether it is candle making or something like this, some skill building, if it can be added onto them for some parts of our patients, for a few of them, it could make a very important positive difference. Nevertheless, understanding their own skills, sharpening the ax and finding direction is also part of that journey at the daycare for our patients. Understanding of the illness, and this comes finally when things are better with them and their cognitive balance has improved, the ability to uh, fine tune things are much better in discussions that we have and later when we reinforce certain aspects of understanding of the illness. And we try to give them understanding of various mental health illnesses so that the focus not, is not on any one person's particular illness, but we all learn more about mental health together. Because today I have depression, but tomorrow I can lead into an addiction 
or day after my child could have a problem to do with attention, focus and concentration. So this journey was also utilized to help them understand basic uh, concepts of mental illness, the need for acceptance that is so important for the recovery process and to understand triggers, very importantly, triggers that lead to their relapses and what can be done uh, for them. Simple things like this is also enlightening for the patient to again have a better uh, wholesome recovery. Understanding their support systems, very important for them to know who they can fall back to. And as I said, their safety net when they have a problem again. We would also throw light upon the fact that our daycare center is a support system for you. Feel free to come back whenever you see that your problem is coming back your way. But important for them to also identify who are the other aspects of their support system. And understanding of this is also part of that journey. Let them understand and value the people who support them and make it a point to outline those aspects of their support system. Supervision and security becomes important for us as well. Understanding what could happen, making sure that at the pantry we don't have too many knives or anything like that and they are kept uh, under uh, lock and key or even your phenyl or things like that in the bathroom. These are aspects that also need to be taken care for. Your cameras that are around and making sure you mention to your patients that there are cameras around, that safety aspect, that security and that supervision becomes important. Sometimes, you know, patients would smuggle in a little bit of tobacco or bring something else along a bhanka goli. So your supervision and security is ideal to make the situations much more feasible for everybody in the daycare center. And that, that is why we would have a male and a female attendant and a psychologist with us so that we could even at times if required do a check with what they have on person so that we make sure our security is not compromised in any way. This is important and vital at the daycare center. Conflict management, there are times when people have got into arguments. Like I said, politics can be very volatile, people against and for a particular political entity and other aspects of having conflict, conflict between patient and uh, staff as well. When uh, sometimes this, you realize that they are breaking into more paranoia and now their paranoia is probably against one of the staff members and they tend to have an argument of the sorts for this. You. I would also make it a point to sensitize our staff to be able to say sorry without understanding the reason for what has happened till we discuss the case later because the patient is prime at that point of time and we know that their balance of mind may not be ideal in that situation. So managing conflict when it's required, sometimes patient and patient problem, patient and uh, uh, some of the staff, this could be a problem, handling that conflict with sensitivity and balancing it out is also important. Having a few serenades, uh, you know, having drops of halopelidol, having something to calm a person if required, when required, is also something we should have uh, with us at the daycare center. And setbacks, we have had problems, we have difficulties, but we have tried to learn from each thing that has come through. Uh, we've had a death of a lady who had a heart attack while she was with us. And it, it was difficult because my car also was not available. It had gone to pick up the kids from school, no ambulance available. I remember my psychologist and me with the patient in between uh, taking them in a rickshaw and going to the closest hospital. Unfortunately, the patient died, but the family was supportive and the family knew that she had a past uh, heart problem and this could have been the cause for this sudden on, uh, onset of a heart attack. But this also made us take a, a letter from the physician to say they are clear of physical problems at that point of time to enter the daycare. So we have learned from different aspects of the setbacks. The setbacks can uh, you know, throw around 360 degrees and help you have a good point that you can make for your daycare center as a plus point. Feedback, ideas, thoughts, comments, suggestions, welcome them because sometimes our own patients and some of them are so creative, some of them are so intelligent, they are able to show us the light and we are open for anything of that sort because when they go through what they go through, 
they can see things in different light. Being open to feedback and suggestions is also the vital aspect of the end of the journey as they leave. Can they guide us to give a better experience to the next patient who comes is something I have always valued from people who have attended my daycare experience. And repeat value, as we realize some patients come back again and again. For them, it really works well, or sometimes they feel that this daycare is a safe space for them. And when they have a problem again, they want to be part of the daycare again. Now, it's also important for you to try and record or keep somewhere what has been done with the patient while they were part of the decay at that point of time, so that we do not repeat the same things and make it again a mundane task or routine for the patient. Because sometimes the patient would say, Haan, sir, ye, ye kahani, ye story humne tab bhi suna tha. or we had done the same thing last time when I came. So if you have a little background as to what was done when this patient came last, and you know he's coming again for this week, you will try not to repeat the same things so that we offer variety and more challenge to the patients who come in at the daycare. Finally, it is teamwork that helps you score. It is the, the people together who put their hearts and hands together that make your daycare rock. Value your staff, always at every point of time, listen to what they have to say and tell them what you want to say. Let there be open channels of communication so that if there is a problem, we tackle it the sooner the better. A stitch in time always saves nine. But that teamwork is the very essence of the patient's recovery during the decay process. Finally, it is sad that during the COVID challenge, we had to put down our shutters for the decay. We could not have it around this, day, uh, this COVID challenge uh, period, but we are now slowly and steadily getting ready to welcome them back again, hoping that things are going to be better for all of us at the COVID scenario. I want to thank uh, Avinash and the BPS team for this wonderful opportunity for us to share our thoughts. And of course, uh, Dr. Anita Sukwani as well, who has uh, helped me put these points together with our discussions of how and what we would put across for the take aspects of this CME today. Thank you once again. I'll stop sharing at this point of time. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for uh, all the insights. We'll, of course, come to your questions post uh, Madam's presentation. Madam, over to you uh, for uh, your presentation. We already introduced you in the beginning, so people are aware of you. So please, please, yeah. Ma'am, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Avinash. Thank you so much. And thank you, Fabian, for making things easier for me. That was a wonderful presentation and a lovely introduction to the daycare. As I take over from uh, Fabian, I'll start my screen share first and then I'll continue. Mm. Just one minute. Just one minute, give me a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, no. What do you need to do? Yes, I'll stop. Mm. Where do you want to go? Now what do you want to do? Yeah. You want to take it to project to Okay, I think we are okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to cover a little about um, the daycare centers in the metropolitan cities. Of course, it covers a lot of what Fabian has said. But before I start, even I'd like to share why and how I thought about getting into the daycare and how it changed my life. I passed out from Nair Hospital, TNMC, with a rich experience of treating loads of patients, inpatient and outpatient. Nair 
exposed me to an occupational therapy and PT department, where he worked with patients and saw positive changes in some patient population. Following that, I had a wonderful opportunity of working with Shitaj Family Welfare Center at Lower Parel. Shitaj had two daycare centers, one for patients with schizophrenia and the other for the geriatric population. I visited the schizophrenia center, uh, the center for schizophrenia once a week, and it taught me a lesson for life. That's where my journey started. It was an intriguing experience to watch the clients move from strength to strength. Each patient was monitored and managed, developing their social skills and overall becoming more independent. Some of them also became financially independent. The realization was the focus had shifted from Nair on learning about man patient management to actually focusing on the patient. This opened up my eyes to a world different from what I had seen till date. And when I visited, this also motivated me to visit Bangalore for an ANSIPS, when I was there for ANSIPS, and I visited the Richmond Fellowship Society, the daycare center called Chetna in Bangalore, which taught me the importance of vocational guidance and a little guidance to it, and how beautifully it can be integrated in the management. So I felt that there was so much more we can do just beyond just medical management. Also in practice, when I was doing my consultation uh, without the daycare, I realized that patients needed more than what I was giving. And they were unwilling to travel to the NGO run daycare centers in Mumbai. So I felt the need to have an in-house facility for my own patients. That's how it started, which then grew beyond that. There is a tremendous need for such centers. Some psychiatric illnesses, particularly, particularly schizophrenia, can be debilitating. It can affect not only the patient, but the entire family, draining them emotionally and financially. Caretaker burnout is a reality. Patients lose their ability to maintain a normal day-to-day -day functioning, affecting their jobs, their independence, their family life, their social life. They are heavily depending on medications. Luckily, newer antipsychotics have helped patients reach a level of recovery where rehabilitation is possible. That's where the role of a daycare center comes in. A daycare center helps bring the psychiatric patients into mainstream to integrate with psychological and social support to both individuals and family, which helps reintegrating patients with mental health disorders back in the community as productive members of society to relearn the forgotten skills and build their capacity to perform various skills. They enhance the ability to cope with the environment. Sorry. Rehabilitation is actually a catalyst that stimulates growth following the person's own timeline, respecting their timeline, building on their strengths and bolstering the person's efforts. So beautifully Fabian highlighted these aspects of the daycare center. So this is how a typical day looks like in a daycare center. Uh, we start off, the typical timetable at the daycare center looks like this. It is a part-time, actually a part-time center without residential facility. The day starts because we highlighted a lot on prayers and taking care of their own personal space where their personal belongings, their yoga mats, and et cetera were kept. Every day we try to introduce different things. So like Fabian said, the uh, aspect of boredom was taken care of. There were group therapy sessions, there were craft, there was dance, occupational therapy, yoga, uh, computer skills were highlighted, physical activity was taken care of with your lunch breaks. And as uh, Fabian highlighted, they have paid attention to difficult things in the morning and the easier things in latter part of the day so that they would be able to cope. There were ad additional activities. I was very, very lucky to be a, uh, introduced to animal angels who assisted me with animal assisted therapy. We had animals coming in once in a day, once a week, once in 15 days to help the patients with a lot of different things which I'm going to highlight on. Gardening became a very important part. Of course, we didn't have the kind of space but yes, each person was given their own plant and was asked to take care of it and look after it. We had a library. 
we put in together a small library where everybody would borrow a few books to take home. There were leisure time activities and planned recreations to various um, outings, like maybe a movie sometimes, to the museum sometimes, and sometimes just having fun together, watching movies at the center. Leisure time activities were also taken care of. <clears throat> leisure time activities also included things like get togethers, Diwali, celebrating Diwali together. I actually managed to uh, do, conduct sports days with the other daycare centers around us, like Prena, Shitej, Manav Foundation. So it really gave them exposure to different things and work on their various skills. Now, a little highlight on vocational training, which we learned was like he uh, made us realize is training in pre-vocation and vocational skills and focus on job placements. So we also did focus on probably, uh, you know, using reusing paper to make the files, greeting cards, focused on hand block printing. That was something that a lot of the women introduced to us, handicrafts, embroidery, book binding, and basic computer skills. And posted the day got over with them leaving the center, they were encouraged to follow a routine. There would be follow-ups as to what they would be doing post four o'clock after leaving the center, whether they were going for their walks, whether they were reading, whether they were having any family time. So a little bit again, focusing on the individual goals. So uh, social interactions in the groups were encouraged, newspaper reading, debates, discussions were done in a group to highlight, make them think things through, encourage sharing, not alone and isolated, but others uh, and how to share the, the struggles of everybody. There was a uh, group dynamics handled through these debates and discussions, role plays and gave them insight about and their problems and also made them realize that everybody is suffering and how everybody is contributing to helping each one. Gardening made them realize how the plants grew and the results of day to day caring were highlighted on. OT and dance focused on gross and fine motor schools. They took, obviously, they helped in combating the side effects of medications. I was very fortunate again with dance therapy to have a group from Shamak Dawa join us and see to it that they learn dance from the basic and help them with their movement and their motor skills. Like discussed earlier, animal therapy was introduced, which opened them. I saw a lot of patients actually interacting with the animal, and then we followed it up to continue this on a day-to-day -day basis with people around them. Emotional expression, it gave way to emotional expression. It helped them express what they were feeling and communicate their feelings in a more positive manner. Like it was highlighted, leisure time persons and planned recreation helped them make friends they promoted harmony, cheer, and interaction with others outside their comfort zone. They, they could actually come out and talk to people, strangers, finding peers who also work as role models. So a lot of them made friends amongst themselves and they followed up with each other beyond the, the hours of the daycare center. That would help motivate them and help them with their recovery process. Also make them realizing that they're uh, working, they know their self-esteem was important vocational training like discussed, we focused a lot of things in which we made them do things and we made them also have exhibitions and sell them. Uh, I'm going to highlight, we used to help them sell them and we used to teach them money management in that. So we encouraged them to go to banks, open an account, deposit money, do small transactions, maintain the accounts other than making various things or exhibitions the money collection after sales, managing accounts and balance sheets were encouraged. We were, gift vouchers were given as positive reinforcement for the hard work that they put in. Some of the patients have integrated into family businesses. Some have worked with NGOs like Prena and Don Bosco as teaching faculty. Some have gone on to become yoga teachers and some have gone back to their old jobs. So even if they came in for a short time, for a few weeks or a few months, they would be able to go back. We would be able to uh, make them realize their potential and go back into society and integrate well with society.
So our approach was strength based and recovery based. The focus on was on personal attributes, talents, their skills, environmental strengthen the environment around them, work on their interest and make them realize their aspirations. We focused on the can do that they could do things. They have the capacity and there is a possibility that they can do things that they could not, they thought they could not do and develop a place in community. <clears throat> there was also very important that we interacted with the family. At the initial stage, there was an in-depth family interview taken so we understand the dynamics of the family, psychoeducation of family members. Importance of regular medications was highlighted and follow up with the treating psychiatrist was highlighted on. We liaison with the psychiatrist to see that symptom management is better and continuity of medication is done. How to education of expressed emotions, discussing with them how the interaction in the family made a difference to the, to the patient care and how to control their emotions in a given environment. Once a month, the caregiver meetings to discuss recovery and strategies were in place. Support groups for family members were also there, where their fears and anxieties in relation with their, the patient were discussed. We also encouraged home visits by the social workers that we had in our group to facilitate daycare center that provided them the comfortable they felt understood and they felt that they could uh, be able to help themselves it also took care of the family and prevented burnout so they could work together as a family healthy family unit a little bit about the challenges in a metropolis of course, it became difficult because it was a city, so traveling was an issue. Time taken to the place was an issue. Transport, we were not able to provide an ambulance for them to come in, but we would be able to sort out that they would travel together in a cab, or they would contact each other and come together. So we had to help them out with the difficulties in transport and really travel. Expenses being in a city, it was not easy to maintain all this. So we had to compromise a little on expenses, but we could meet whatever we could. And getting them jobs, it was a struggle to work with the NGOs, to work with schools, to work with different organizations, to put them into jobs. And even if it were clerical jobs, but it was a challenge which we learned to overcome and learned to manage on a regular basis. Of course, the most uh, difficult challenge that we have had has been of COVID. Like Fabian mentioned, unfortunately, one and a half year ago, our daycare center was closed down. But within a few months, once we realized we got our bearings together, we managed to reach out to our patients and continue occupational therapy sessions and counseling sessions on, on the Zoom medium or on online mediums. Whether they preferred individual sessions or whether they preferred on a Zoom call, it was worked out and we did manage to do some work with them. And we are looking and hoping in the near future to get back the daycares in completely functional. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Well, um, if uh, there are any questions, I would request uh, the audience to uh, just put them in the chat box because uh, Any specific questions that you may have about uh, daycare services based on the presentation that Madam and Fabian have made? Uh, Dr. Ashutosh wants to know what is the monthly cost to the patient? Fabian and Madam, both of you could answer. And uh, someone has asked, how do you manage the expenses that is incentives given to the patients? I'll take that. Like yeah. I said, it was very tough 
to keep the um, expenses minimal because we had the staff to pay. But uh, in we had to pay my maximum. I have gone up to was ten thousand rupees in a month, with of course trying to do our best. and giving them the gift vouchers came from whatever stuff that they created whatever they would make we would have exhibitions and invite people from different ngos and people in our environment friends family to come and attend these um, exhibitions and whatever this uh, soul the money collected like i said we were making them do banking and we were also from that part partial money was given as tokens to them for the positive reinforcement okay and someone has asked how did you manage the staff payment when the daycare center was closed during covid <laughs> do we have, do we have a choice <laughs> right right managed <laughs> yeah. is it limited only to adults 18 plus yes yes, yes. Yeah. this was limited to adults we we would take in kids but it would require a little bit of preparation that means if we saw kids with problems uh, attention concentration or Uh, we also had types with schools uh, where there was suspension for the problems or the activities for a few days and they were asked to, to attend the daycare uh, to help them get better and understand their problem better so we would then shortlist four or five children and together then that week would have been dedicated for daycare for children so all the activities etc also would be outlined keeping children in mind okay and uh, any any um, legal formalities you'll have to undergo before starting the dk center um so like paben mentioned effectively consents were taken family was involved the history notes everything was kept recorded but um, and of course they were provided with a note saying that they were suffering from this disease and they were attending the daycare center but beyond that i never faced any difficulties i think and and a note to the municipal corporation that you have started this and this is our outline where they come in and go at this time so that letter is what we had to provide to the me being yeah. in kalyan the kdmc yeah um uh, ashutosh has asked are there any government schemes which reimburse the patients for these costs i think the patient uh, the, the caregivers are better aware of all these because at that time itself they will tell you that my company pays this Correct. much for that and give me this or this is what we have the so when there is expenditure the onus is on them they usually take the extra mile to find out and come uh, with the details to us correct uh fabian you of course mentioned about you know one patient having a heart attack and how we all rushed uh, dr omkar mathi has asked any incidents in the dk center where it required more than psychiatry skills uh <laughs> <laughs> no. we work within our framework uh, but then yes we try and do what we can and where we realize we have challenges we reach out to those who can help us psychiatric skills were the most important thing i remember the time when we had a kleptomaniac who was a child who was around 12 years and the time he tried he tried to run away he got away with our charity box after the post lunch walk and then we needed skills to run to have presence of mind and that all was something we had to develop further for the daycare on our own is so i'd like to add to that is in my daycare center one of the persons uh, helping me was actually a patient who had recovered and he was a part of the team helping us with handling the whole daycare center so he knew a lot how to handle the patient how to you know calm the patient down how to prevent violence and i think the my whole team by in a, in a year or two had become quite quite conditioned and quite prepared to be able to handle uh, difficult situations but particularly there were some patients who were getting very aggressive at times but i think over the years they learned how to handle the situation well uh, someone and us what is the manpower required to make up a team at a dk center <laughs> well we would have uh, people who would come in as experts also that means people who sing people who dance people who have art and craft as their background but essentially so we had uh, a lady a psychologist we had a gen psychologist because that was important for us we had a yoga teacher and this was primarily our team with other visiting faculty yeah 
and uh, about the activities done at the center how do you decide what activities to do and you know revenues and profits from the products made who i mean buys these products and you know uh, how do you all sort of manage that i think anita would uh, answer that better because we had not done vocational skills training for our patients but i think she'll be able to yeah yeah no so one was the payment of the staff so we were very lucky the people who were working with us had a um, like shamak dawar who helped us do dance had a section which they would do uh, voluntary work so they would come at a very minimum uh, pay scale even animal angels the animal uh, therapists would give concessions so that that really helped us you know cutting costs in running because like sometimes you had to pull in yoga teachers whom you knew from the past who knew you would do a good job and take a concessional rate so we had to work hard on you know cutting getting the rates reduced whereas it when it came to uh, vocational training i think i learned a lot my whole team who used to come in and help we this i mean read about it use newspapers you know used articles reinvented things um you know even the block printing one of the women would get the block printing get cloth and do it and i would have at least once in six months or, or so an exhibition where i would invite a lot of my friends and family all the patients were encouraged to invite friends and family and the other centers like mana and shitij all of them would be invited so that's how the pop population would be there and i think they were quite generous and i think as uh, t siva kumar also has mentioned we had uh, uh, yes we did have patients who would come in who had talents and and skills who would come in and like to share that for the other patients and that would become part of the dk experience as well so it was almost like recycling talent and time for others to feel better as well yeah Uh, anjali kattare want to know any uh, use of animal assisted therapy in a daycare i mean any experience with that you know yeah yeah i did mention i had once a week an animal assisted therapist coming in but especially the people who had a little phobia and would not be able to communicate express their ideas it worked beautifully for them also a lot of bonding so i had experience with people who would not communicate or were not able to express with the animal all these inhibitions were the work done and the feedback i would get from the families was that they would go home and try you know even when the strangers came in they would try and communicate they would be able to express their emotions better so it worked beautifully i mean i think animals bring out the best in human beings <laughs> right oh uh... fine i um, with how many patients did you start the center at first dr jyoti maheshwari wants to know ah oh, that's a tough one it obviously started with you know around six patients and it grew it grew as the word spread like i said liaisoning with different psychiatrists my own patient population word of mouth it spread so it it grew over the years okay thus we we started with about 3 or 4 and the Uh, we would not exceed a number of more than eight to twelve, so that our interactions were in in the limited space we had, so that our interactions would be great. But there is one memory that I have, which is very close to my heart, is every afternoon I had lunch with my patients. So I sat on the floor, and we all opened our dabbas, and food has always been something very close to my heart. So we bonded with having our dabbas together from Monday to Friday. and that brought a certain bit of you know uh, a connection and a bonding between my patient and myself as well and i treasure those moments of having my lunch with my my dabba would come from home we would all open our dabbas and we would share it was a wonderful experience for me i it's it's something that has been very close to my heart no i agree with you kevin because that would also start a conversation about the kind of food the healthy food the non healthy food what was required how the medication side effects were affecting and how to combat it so that would get into a conversation also i focused a lot also uh, importance of prayer like the beginning would start with me with all of them praying whatever culture they came from that also added a lot of bonding you know and comfort all right well uh i think uh, yeah that's all about the questions which are there we will now move on to our uh, two next uh, speakers and um, 
Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Amar Shinde, who's going to speak about inpatient rehabilitation and the challenges. Uh, Dr. Amar Shinde is a good friend of mine, and he's done his post-graduation in psychiatry from the BJ Medical College, Pune. He was president of MAD over there and was successful in, in, in um, conducting a strike which increased the payment of residents threefold in 2005-2006. Immediately after passing out, he thought of rehabilitation as a key to treatments in psychiatry and he visited various centers in and out of India to gain some expertise. He started the one of the first dementia care centers in Maharashtra and also has developed a chain of rehabilitation centers, I think called Jagruti Rehabilitation Centers, which has centers in Pune, Mumbai and Delhi. Uh, our second uh, speaker for today is uh, Ronnie Thomas, who's going to speak about uh, the Ronnie George, who's going to speak about the administration issues in a rehab center. And uh, Ronnie is the founder of the Chaitanya Institute for Mental Health, which provides 800 beds for rehabilitation. He has over 22 years of experience. He's also a member of the State Mental Health Authority. And he's currently doing his PhD on Indian perspectives on institutionalizational care of patients with dementia and Alzheimer's. So we're very happy. Uh, incidentally, accidentally, lovingly, both of them are from Pune. So we're very happy to have both of you all here for this session. So over to you, Amar, first. You have around 20, 25 minutes to present what you want, then Ronnie, and then we'll have questions for the two of you all. Yeah. Thank you, Avinash, sir, uh, for kind in introduction. Today, uh, uh, we have given a uh, uh, responsibility to talk on rehabilitation center. So uh, the second talk is about administration. So I will be talking about difficulties uh, about the rehabilitation center. What, what, what difficulties we usually face in running the center? Especially in these uh, difficult times, currently uh, because of COVID, a lot of restriction, a lot of problems, financial and multiple things are there. So I will start with. So in pension re rehabilitation is usually th there is huge need for uh, rehabilitation. If we see a lot of patients in OPDs or uh, in OPD basis, so in my experiences. If we add rehabilitation to the uh, OPD patients or uh, any acute patients or chronic patients, sometimes the results are much better and uh, the functionality of the patients usually recover. As these daycare centers are also uh, one of the key uh, to start, it is needed a lot. So usually we can divide patients in two uh, parts, acute and chronic. Usually I feel if the patient is uh, less than 30 days, we can say it, it is an acute patient. So usually for acute patient, uh, fast symptomatic improvement is required. So uh, routine treatment uh, along with the medical treatment, counseling and other therapies. And for chronic patient, usually we take a little time to analysis and the treatment part goes very slow. So the first problem is at the admission itself. In admissions, Usually in the rehab center, some patients are uh, bring without their uh, will. So these patients are sometimes difficult to uh, manage. Also acute violent patient, uh, managing them is also very uh, challenge and suicidal patients is another big problem for the rehabilitation. Because usually what happens to these patients, we have the responsibility as a rehab center, patients are admitted without relatives. And uh, we are also responsible for patients' well-being. So these are very sensitive cases, and sometimes uh, patient may get hurt or uh, may get some problem also. So we have to talk with the families, relatives, discussions. These are uh, sometimes difficult to manage. Also, documentation part. The new law has come, but the documentation and other things are not yet clear cut. And that is also uh, very challenging to uh, run a rehab center. If there is a particular protocol, then there is a no problem. Suicidal patients. Suicidal patients are particularly at risk. We need 24 hours watch on this patient. Sometimes cameras are fitted in their rooms 
and a uh, room should be uh, made like uh, uh, to prevent any type of attempts because they can do uh, they can have attempts also like small injuries to uh, their wrist or they can bang head or they can uh, sometimes they don't eat and uh, because of so much responsibility the communications with the relatives and uh, continuous talking with them is so much important and these patients are particular risk many center have attempts of uh, these patients and uh, uh, our staff should be very vigilant uh, while dealing with suicidal patient the second most common problem is violence usually uh, when any uh, manic patient or any violent patient came so restraints are sometimes required we have to take consent from the relatives about the restraint some relatives are resisting to restrain some relatives are very cooperative and also while sedating such patient there is also challenge because sometimes some patient may get excessive sedation and that is also issue and few patient escape from the center also it is rare uh, but usually uh, if they escape then they are, again the family can blame us why the patient is escaped why you have not kept uh, proper precaution but even although lot of precaution is taking sometimes rarely it happens one or two times in a year we can say and uh, escape patients we have to inform the police and uh, also have family members fortunately every escaping patient usually go to home only second thing is injury sometime patient can fall patient can hurt himself patient can uh, like head injuries are also there so these are also very challenging patients and we have to deal with it uh, very uh, precautiously third problem will be the withdrawals if the patients of alcohol or opioid patients are admitted we have to deal with this withdrawal they may go in the delirium and sometimes deliriums are also very serious conditions we have to treat them properly we have to understand their quantity of alcohol or opioid and accordingly we have to replace the proper doses and if you replace properly then there will be no worries for the withdrawal opioid withdrawal is also very difficult sometimes it can last for 15 days sometimes and convulsions convulsions also we have to prevent convulsions so the doses of the replacement drugs should be proper so some withdrawal patients uh, may get serious and we need referral to the other hospitals or and this everything we have to co communicate very well with the patients relatives dementia delirium we have a lot of dementia patients also and they are having delirium so these patients are always confused they can wander they can have uh, there are multiple problems for this patient in delirium they don't understand what is going on so we have to be very precaution uh, uh, during this delirium phase sometimes this delirium can be fluctuating so at times patient is comfortable that time we have to do all activities to the patient like feeding their uh, bathing their cleaning everything should be there and in case of delirium we have to talk loudly with the patient we have to uh, always be around with uh, with the patients because they can fall in delirium also they can eat sometimes they have sudden aspiration sudden choking is also there so lots of problems are happening with the dementia patient we uh, only thing is communication communications with the caregivers communication with the relatives is the key hygiene maintenance hygiene maintenance is also a big challenge for uh, psychiatric patients particularly if we see disorganized schizophrenia patients or uh, chronic cases or residual schizophrenia patients their hygiene is not maintaining usually their cloth and other things we have to look after continuously their oral hygiene are not properly the brushing their uh, cleaning is most important and also because of their hygiene problem they have lots of infection also so sometimes it comes in the rehabs like uh, scabies can come so if one patient is getting infected all patient can get infected so we have to continuously watch this patient continuously check whether they have this problem or not lice is another issue lice and scabies are most important 
fungal infections are also common. So we have to look after uh, patients properly about their hygiene. We have a particular protocol about hygiene so that uh, we can prevent these problems. Medical emergencies. As already uh, Dr. Avinash uh, said, he, do you have other things than uh, psychiatry? So in rehab, of course, there are multiple emergencies. There are sudden deaths or sometimes sudden cardiac issues and aspiration is the one of the most problematic thing which is usually common in the older ages and these or sudden chokings these are the medical emergencies usually we have to tackle so we should have some medical knowledge we should have that type of expert uh, staff also sometimes the expert nurses also will help in this condition or general doctors also uh, needed physician visits are also important we should have uh, some uh, particular emergency instrument with us like oxygen cylinder should be there, umbo bags, then uh, at least airway, intubation set, laryngoscope, these type of things we should have. We should have a separate emergency medical tray in which such patients can be uh, managed at least till the patient is shifted to the hospital, nearby hospital. And ambulance numbers are also should be written uh, on the walls uh, so that any staff immediately can uh, call to the ambulance people. Financial burden. Usually, uh, because of this uh, psychosis and other things, a lot of families are suffering from financial issues. So paying fees is also one of the big challenge. Sometimes some, uh, some relatives don't pay uh, or they hide. Sometimes uh, they keep pending. These are also very much challenging and particularly in this COVID times, there are a lot of challenges because of these financial issues. And uh, we are also going through the burden. Caregivers. Caregivers are most important uh, in the treatment and rehabilitation as all patients. Usually we found two types of uh, relatives. Some are excessively involved with the patient. They are so much worried, they are continually calling about the patient, they want to talk to them, they want to uh, indulge in the treatment, they will always ask about the treatment. And this type of people can, uh, because of them, there may be sometimes problem in the treatment of the patients. So we have to handle their emotions also. Even in the admission, uh, even while admission, if there is a first time admission, usually family members are too much concerned. They can have multiple emotions like frustration, depression, uh, they can uh, feel guilty why I'm admitting my patient. And because of that, sometimes some patients could not get proper treatment. And some care caregivers we are seeing, they are absolutely opposite. They are not at all caring. Even in the after admissions, they will not come, they will not call. And for such relatives, it is very difficult to treat such patients. So we have to uh, give proper caregivers education their continuous counseling, their contact, their touch. These are most important thing for the patient. At the time of discharge also, we have a lot of issues. Like if some patient is discharged, like yesterday one patient was discharged and his wife was telling, if he would remain uh, better for a few months, then I will come to stay with him. So these type of things happen in the relatives. And if there is no proper support system, then the treatment result will be very less. Even for the maintenance of the medication, the supervision of the medications is important. Insight is one of the thing which is required for patients. We, uh, uh, if patients have good insight about the illness, then there, are, there is a good result. The same insight should be with the relative also because some patients feel these are the normal symptoms. These are a depression or somatic symptoms. They are, they are normal and then there is a problem. So we have challenges every point of time and we have to look after it. Staffs, usually getting staff is very difficult. When we started initially, then there is a lot of challenge because many times what happens is many people don't uh, like to work in psychiatric setups. Even they are, they are uh, psychologists or social workers or general people, the willingness to work in psychiatric setup is not there. There is a lot of stigma in the society about the psychiatric center also. 
but once the staff comes or a person look after the patients then they start believing that this is a simple treatment and it is like a general hospital retaining staff is also a big challenge because there is no proper training and when the staff comes we usually give them training after training usually they uh, look after the patient very well but to retain such patient is a big challenge particularly for dementia patient if one person is working with dementia patient so dementia patient uh, usually get used to with the person and if the person suddenly goes then there is a big problem sometimes they go in the delirium stages they are uncooperative they are not eat food and other things so retaining staff is also big challenge because the staffs who works over a period of time long period they know about us uh, we know about them and uh, uh, they care patients very well there is also a lot of unskilled staff there are no proper trainings so i think we should all start some uh, training centers also for uh, people to work in the rehab center outside country there are a lot of uh, training courses like ward wise or mental health uh, professionals we don't have uh, such programs here that's why there are a lot of unskilled staff uh, and they are not treating patient properly so we have to get them training properly so we have we should have team uh, now dr uh, no, uh, roni will talk about the administration the psychiatrists counselors social workers attendants and occupational therapists all are required but usually the costing of the center will go high if we hire more people or sometimes the staff payment is also high and that burden will go to the patients and the, uh, again the problem for the patient happens so we have to always think about the patient and this pandemic pandemic added to our already lot of challenges are, are there and in pandemic we were badly hit even outside country in europe and other things uh, and here also many centers including our center got this infection yeah. if infection enter in the center it is very difficult to control because if it goes in on the one floor the psychiatric patients or uh, other dementia patient they don't know about this uh, pandemic sometimes they are uh, they don't use mask they can't keep distances so what we did we usually uh, segregated patient those who were positive they were uh, in the one ward and other patients were in the other wards even government hospitals were not ready to accept our psychiatric patients some one violent patient was there with covid positive in the first phase so it was very difficult and challenging and after challenge we learned a lot about uh, this pandemic and many patients are treated at our center itself isolation is big challenge for these patients in covid because they are unable to we, we cannot uh, isolate them because they keep on wandering 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 so almost every patient uh, got exposed to the covid including our staff also so in this cases also relatives always used to ask us why it came inside you you have taken so much precaution even though we took lot of precautions in covid it came unfortunately but uh, we somehow could stop and the mortality rates was very less one or two deaths in pune center was there and bombay also few one or two so in this pandemic again the staff were, were not coming properly there were uh, scarcity of staff the doctors and also uh, it was a very challenging period for us everyone so we, when it rains look for the rainbows and when it's dark look for the stars so uh, on this uh, we are fighting uh, for the betterment of the psychiatric patient we always try to do uh, novel ideas like they are already madam told about the daycare center the activities the similar activities we do here but there are particularly different uh, problems for the psychiatric uh, running a psychiatric rehab center there are multiple issues legal issues are there documentation procedures are not proper and these are adding to our problems also the cost and rent or uh, the purchase of the property is also high so that's why the uh, cost to the patient is also high so that is making a lot of problem 
for running a rehabilitation center. But we are definitely coming uh, out of it and uh, we'll do better for the betterment of the mental health patients. Thank you, Avinash. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amar. Uh, uh, you can just stop sharing and then I will uh, hand over to Ronnie. Uh, yes, Ronnie, uh, the floor is yours. Next 20, 25 minutes. Then following that, uh, we will have question answers. There are already some questions come in, but we'll take them all up after uh, your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Abhinash. And also, Amar, you have made my work very easy because, you know, it is the challenges that is um, faced by uh, psychosocial rehabilitation centers. Now, I have. Uh, well, um, when we talk about uh, challenges faced by administration wise, you know, we need to have a proper idea about the concept of psychosocial rehabilitation. Now, people, there are different people coming to uh, psychosocial rehabilitation centers with different ideas. Uh, you know, Everybody is concerned about the well-being, certainly, of course, their um, uh, dear and near ones. But, you know, unfortunately, psychosocial rehabilitation is mostly misunderstood and taken care by, you know, if you go to X, Y, Z place, my son, my daughter should be getting some remuneration. Uh, remuneration. That means uh, psychosocial rehabilitation um, program is supposed, many, for many of them, it is a alternative arrangement to earn some money or you know learn new things the people who were not even educated by 10th standard they wanted to become computer professionals at a psychosocial rehabilitation please we need to understand and make other people understand this is an ongoing process where the patients with the psycho various kind of chronic illnesses are admitted and we try to identify the residual capacities, the talents, the skills that one has, and we try to promote those. And we need to also try to identify what are the limitations a patient has, and we try to arrest the growth of those kind of limitation. That is psychosocial rehabilitation. And it is going to be an um, ongoing process. Once a patient is diagnosed with uh, any sort of mental illness, I think most of the time, this, is, this has to work as a continuous uh, process. We try to mainstream the patients, imparting social skill training or activities for daily life, et cetera, to make a person successful or come into uh, mainstream. Now, we have legal aspects. That is psychosocial rehabilitation versus hospital or psychiatric nursing home because the psychosocial rehabilitation um, unfortunately in Maharashtra there is no separate legal um, clarity who can run a psychosocial rehabilitation center what is the criteria to run a psychosocial rehabilitation center and what are the staffing pattern it is not clear in at least in Maharashtra whereas if you look at um, Tamil Nadu Kerala Karnataka, I'm sure that Dr. Kalyana Sundaram would be able to throw more light into this issue. And um, Gujarat, they have a separate psychosocial rehabilitation centers criteria. And even Goa, for that matter, it is far better. So therefore, when we have to run a psychosocial rehabilitation center in state of Maharashtra, we have to get it registered under, under hospital yeah, nursing home license. So the biggest problem is going to be the staffing pattern, duration of stay, licensing, biomedical waste management, local body licensing. Now coming to the staff pattern for a hospital, uh, for a psychiatric nursing home, every four patient is supposed to have a certain number of um, staff nurse, then every X number of patient is supposed to have a certain number of supporting staff and uh, so on. 
But actually, when you talk about a psychosocial rehabilitation centers, you don't need to have that kind of nursing staff in, uh, instead. You may need to have a lot of counselors, <laughs> lot of counselors um, supporting staff, and a few nursing staff as compared to the nursing home, psychiatric nursing home. Now coming to the next question, duration of the stay. What is going to be the ideal duration of a stay for a patient in a psychosocial rehabilitation center? Again, Dr. Kalyana Sundaram is the man who can command on this with authority, but we believe for a psycho proper psychosocial rehabilitation, at least a year is required. But in Maharashtra, we often practice, you know, one month to three months. Actually, it is based because there was earlier Mental Health Care Act 1987. They suggested you can keep a patient up to 90 days. That is why probably this 90 days thing has come into practice here. Uh, actually, you, you need to have a longer duration of the stay for a patient to get recover and come into the mainstream. Now, licensing. See, licensing when you go to uh, when the inspection committee or licensing authority comes to a rehab center or a uh, psychiatric nursing home there are so many uh, psychiatric nursing home which is existing in maharashtra now for a psychosocial rehabilitation center they say this is a biomedical waste management is a, a prerequisite now you tell me what is going to be the biomedical waste in a rehab center yes i do agree there may be some uh, syringes and other things. But for that, if when you go to a uh, local body licensing, see, first of all, we need to understand if your nursing home is licensed under the government of Maharashtra or for that matter, any state government licensing authority, you need not to have local body license for your hospital. But this, unfortunately, we are unable to yeah. convince we are unable to convince them saying that as per the rule, if you are licensed under a licensing authority, you need not to have a local body. That means a corporation um, license you don't require, but it becomes yeah. a futile exercise. I both agree. I mental health care. <laughs> uh, so therefore, uh, that is not required. So it becomes a um, difficult task for us to um, manage the psychosocial rehabilitation center. Now, coming to psychosocial rehabilitation center is certainly a multidisciplinary and teamwork. There needs to be a mutual respect paid to each one. There are all, all the, see, a doctor to supporting staff, nursing staff, everybody has a crucial role to play in this kind of centers. So there has to, they need to work as a link between link in the chain and a mutual respect has to be paid to everyone. Now coming to the most important administrative difficulty is uh, expenditure. The expenditure, you need to have a huge lot of staff to work in a uh, successful rehabilitation center. So therefore, the functional expenditure becomes very, um, it becomes a major issue. Whereas if a psychiatric patient is admitted into a psychiatric nursing home, maybe his duration of stay may be about a couple of weeks uh, or a, about a month. They may be able to pay about a lakh rupee for an admission. But when it comes to a rehab center, they expect it has to be that um, minimum and even a 20,000, 22,000 becomes a major issue. Another major issue that is faced by psychosocial rehabilitation center are, are lack of trained mental health professional. So uh, lack of mental health professional is a major issue. Then, uh, which, uh, which is already covered uh, by uh, um, Dr. Amar Shinde. Now coming to the sensitization and the capacity building of a staff, you know, very often it is, people do ask. Yesterday I was talking to a family member, you know, they, somebody called me for a fresh admission. 
the last question that they wanted to ask was tell me frankly we hear that psychosocial rehabilitation center use you know it there is a manhandling happening no that is absolutely wrong therefore uh, in order to prevent that you need to have a regular capacity building program with your own staff because it is you know most of the residential centers the staff are also residential so there is a high rate of irritability dominance dominance happening from the staff side so the people who are in the administrative uh, side they need to be extremely careful to avoid these kind of uh, issues uh, or the conflict or also we come across we, we also have experience the staff feel hey you are a patient with a mental illness i am your staff therefore you have to know it it just cannot be tolerated in this kind of places therefore because uh, the patient has to uh, be treated with a dignity and uh, uh, you know me personally i personally believe that each patient is our bread and butter so therefore the high uh, they have to be respected the most next issue that we come across stigma superstition and high rate of expressed emotion of a family members they do come with lot of plan somebody came i want to plant a plant and tree outside your center then you have to pour water and uh, you know the patient has to go out to walk around see these are the some of the things expectation that a family has which is not going to be uh, which is you know we have to take care of the emotional issues of the family at the same time we cannot just uh, practice all these kind of things we have to use a scientific method in um, uh, taking care of the persons with uh, any sort of mental illness the people do come they ask abhi kitna din aur lagega you know when will he be ab able to start earning so these kind of the questions we do come across very often another major important issue in the administrative side is the lack of network between rehab centers you know um, it is a it is a very you know unorganized sector where i personally believe there has to be um, a network happening among the rehab centers uh, because see suppose there are so many incidents that we come across suppose something goes wrong see we are all uh, vulnerable at times with a physical or verbal abuse of local uh, people i mean uh, some of the nasty relatives we may come across so you know suppose something happens there should be someone that you can follow up on that it has to be uh, taken uh, looked into and taken care of and managing psychiatric emergencies which i have already uh, mentioned by dr amar shinde um, many a time when we have a psychiatric rehabilitation center it is not necessary that we have a very well equipped hospital nearby or we ourselves is you know equipped with handling various physical illness or physical emergency emergencies it may not be possible so for example suppose a patient is having a fall and have a, a fracture once when you take to a general hospital the first thing that they may do is that reporting to the police because you know there is a mentally ill patient there is an injury happen there is a, um, a fracture there so it goes into mlc so mlc may the police doesn't know what is actually happening and uh, the patients the persons with uh, some of the psychiatric illness they look perfectly fine they can well articulate and they can talk well so police push the isko kyon hai you know why you have to admit him you tell see it becomes a major challenge making them understand and as everyone has mentioned um uh staff burnout staff burnout is one of the major challenges that we all need to face because uh, it it is a residential job that most of them do so there is a chance high chances of staff burnout and staff turn out also because you know people come work for one year then we as an administrators we become only a, uh, a training center uh, 
आज एक साल के लिए यू ट्रेन समबडी देन दे वंस दे आर एबल टू वर्क वेल दे आर अबाउट टू लीव सो दीस आर द सम ऑफ द मेजर चैलेंजेस दैट वी हैव बीन फेसिंग नाउ ड्यूरिंग द कोविड सिचुएशन you know even if a patient needs to be admitted to a private or a covid center we faced a lot of issues uh, for example hearing that this is a psychiatric patient they never used to admit and if at all we admit suppose if they called in and we are there one of our staff or family member could be there as a bystander bystander but unfortunately in this once the patient goes in we don't even know what is happening inside so it was a, a big time big challenge that we had as dr amar shinde mentioned uh, we also uh, faced a lot of financial issues due to covid non payment issues and uh, uh, you know yes we also hope to survive this and we also uh, hope to come back to a uh, proper care and you know we will be able to provide them with a proper care thank you so much open for questions uh thank you rani and amar i think the first question that someone has asked is what is the protocol for a completed suicide or you know a death that happens at the center is there any protocol you'll have in place i mean anyone could i mean it's asked to you amar it came after your talk but i mean if not bad something you're welcome first amar please yes uh, if any uh, death occurs uh, in the hospital after emergency care usually we have to inform uh, relatives we have to inform uh, police for that and uh, we have to send the body for the post mortem uh, every uh, person who has died in the hospital we should send them to the post mortem so usually if you are having good communication with the family then uh, so many times the problems will not happen but uh, if any uh, issue happens then on, then also you have to go uh, with the legal way if the uh, patient is died uh, on the spot if it is looking like a suicide or any other thing you don't uh, touch the uh, area around it okay if patient is already died if patient is serious you can go for the intervention otherwise you have to keep all things in the place so that uh, if police comes they can watch all the things they can have photographs and other things also and uh, if you inform the police can come there they can uh, go through the uh, investigation they will ask people they will ask our staff what happened why this happened if in in this uh, case of suicide but in sudden death uh, usually we have to inform the relatives and the relative will take the uh, patient to the post mortem yes i mean okay uh, uh, rani could you please uh, st uh, stop sharing so that we'll get the full screen yeah one minute yeah. Uh, uh, someone has yeah. asked that uh, government has announced some vaccinations for stop indoor stop sharing yeah just stop sharing yeah yeah a uh, government has announced that there's some vaccination for uh, indoor psychiatric patients so is there any particular authority to approach or is there anything that way uh, any idea you all would have on that yeah usually uh, see if you look at our place uh, most of the patients almost all the patients are vaccinated and um, we have to approach the municipal corporation for that and that is what we have done all our patients are vaccinated okay okay and amar uh, okay they uh, do come to the center and do it right uh, amar uh, devas at the time of admission to your rehab what are the points covered in the consent form for patient and caregiver usually uh, in consent and declaration form uh, we have to write everything uh, including the treatment protocol the medication the side effect of the medications then the our plan of the treatment then if a patient is uh, critical or medically serious we have to take the seriousness consent if the patient is uh, uh, violent or uh, violent or normal patient also we we are taking restraint consent also uh, with the patients and uh, other routine uh, formalities are uh, also there right uh, well uh, devas do you combine if you combine acute care and rehab patients i mean what are the challenges that you face and how are you all managing involuntary patients in the current scenario anyone can answer yeah roni yeah uh, acute and yeah. Uh, 
yes yes man go ahead in case of involuntary we still follow the consent of uh, involuntary admissions we do still follow the two doctors certification um and uh, yes it is always ideal to have acute patients separated from the uh, you know recovering patients so that would be uh, certainly it is going to help the patients uh, amar you cannot do that yeah yes uh, acute patient usually uh, the acute patient ward is uh, different than uh, long term patients and acute patients are more on the special watch uh, their their treatment and other plans are different from the long term patients right uh, someone has asked has abandonment of any patient by the family happened in your uh, uh, rehab and how has such a situation been tackled or you know whatever it is a it is a very common problem many times it happens the uh, bills are pending and relatives are not uh, coming also so for few patients we have to take them to their home and we uh, drop them at uh, their house at, at our cost and uh, other finances uh, we lost everything <laughs> so this is this is common particularly for the older patient and also for schizophrenia patient it happens right uh, ronny dev asked what are the licenses that you need for a uh, you know a center i mean what all various licenses would you need hello ronny am i audible psychiatric license uh, yeah usually they give uh, psychiatric license uh, we also do have uh, mumbai nursing home uh, a small part for the right. uh, like uh, emergency patients we have uh, 15 bed Bombay Nursing Home Act license also, along okay. with the psychiatric okay. license. Okay. And other things like uh, uh, we have to go for the uh, biomedical vest. That is important. That certificate is also uh, important. Right. And uh, fire and other things. These are also required. Right. Uh. Okay. Now, do you have any particular strategies for retention of staff? That's what <laughs> someone has asked. Rani, 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 yeah. Any particular <laughs> strategies for retention of staff? Retention of the staff, you have to, you have to pay them better, and you have to, you know, it, it, it should be lucrative for them. That is the only way you can retain the staff. Right. Their, their job, there, there should be job satisfaction. So usually we do some uh, programs, birthdays, and other things. They should be happy that we have to uh, do. for that and uh, of course payment is also another issue uh, main issue right right um well amar i will just ask you one question since you know it was there in your introduction i mean uh, are the challenges in you know running a dementia center different from you know a sort of rehab because uh, you know you also have a dementia center that you manage so i said i'll just ask yes uh, dementia patients are uh, more difficult sometimes uh, their treatment and uh, care pattern is totally different than uh, psychiatric patients dementia patient there is we have to be prepared for the medical emergencies always because usually they have these problems aspiration constipation then uh, obstruction urine infections so we have to be uh, uh, ready with all medical services in house along with that uh, their care is totally different the attendant should be trained the diaper changing their exercises is important so physiotherapy is one of the main part in uh, dementia care they always need some exercise of walking the cognitive uh, stimulation is always required so uh, and the medication part is less than psychiatric patient psychiatric patient have more medication dementia patient we don't use antipsychotic or other drugs so uh, the medication part is also different yes right okay i think uh, yeah that's about all as far as our questions go uh, i will now move on to my last speaker our last speaker for the evening uh, dr kalyan s kalyan sundaram uh, well uh, dr s kalyan sundaram has been in the field of psychiatry for over four and a half decades the last 45 years he was a faculty at nimhans till 1981 and then went on to private practice he's been actively involved in psychiatric rehabilitation for more than 30 years 
and has got awards from the IPS for his contributions to rehabilitation and also has been awarded by the American Psychiatric Association. He's very passionate about learning and teaching. And uh, well, personally, I have seen him as a kid. So I have, you know, a lot of respect and love for him. So please welcome and please share your thoughts on long term rehabilitation, particularly with the Richmond experience that you would like to share. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avinash. As he mentioned that he has seen me when he was young, that just shows as he is in older, I have just become a geriatric age. Thank you very much to you and also to the Bombay Psychiatric Association for inviting me to this very exciting event on rehabilitation. It's not very common that psychiatric societies offer platform for psychiatric rehabilitation. I'm happy to see Bombay Psychiatric Society has made it a point to use this platform for sharing knowledge and information from fellow professionals. Uh, he's asked me to talk about the long-term rehabilitation of Richmond Fellowship experience. Now, let me start with the, the brief history of Richmond Fellowship. It was initially first started in 1959 in UK by one single person by name Ellie Janssen. She's 90 plus years now. She's still working about uh, 12 to 14 hours a day, single-handed. She was responsible for starting this program in over 30 countries. Our operations all across the globe uh, work on therapeutic community principles. And we have branches in Bangalore, we started first in 1986. We have a branch in Delhi, which is located in Greater Noida. Siddhalagata is a rural branch, which is in Chikbalapur district in Karnataka. Lucknow branch in 2007. And we have four branches all over India. And to kind of a provide an overarching supervisory role or a national role, we have a, what is called a national board of the Richmond Fellowship Society, which started in 2001. And it is located in Bangalore. Uh, fortunately, we have this experience of running three different facilities. We are in a halfway home, which started in 1986, and a long stay home, we started in 1995. Silver Jubilee was last year, but unfortunately, due to COVID, it could not be done. And we have a daycare center, we started in 1997, whose Silver Jubilee will be next year. In the halfway home, we have 14 men and nine women, 23 people. In the long stay home, we have nine men and eight women. In the daycare center, we have about 50 to 55 people coming every day, uh, which includes some of our own patients from the, our halfway home and the long stay home also. For some of you who may also know, we started the first ever postgraduate college offering psychosocial rehabilitation and counseling in Southeast Asia, which is a full-time two-year program affiliated to Rajiv Gandhi University, RCA recognized, uh, UGC recognized, and recognized by the government of Karnataka. We ran a two-year full-time program, and before which we used to run short-term courses for rehabilitation. As one of them, some of the speakers mentioned earlier, we do not have a single center in the country which offers training exclusively, to my knowledge, exclusively for providing psychosocial rehabilitation training, which we started. And unfortunately by 2016, 15, 16, we had to close it for lack of finances, which is a very sad event. It is like raising a child and bringing up to an adolescent age and abandoning it. We had no option but to close that center. Let's talk about Jyoti Longshogam. You see this building, this is where we started first in 1995. This was started in September 95. How did it happen? We had been running the last previous 10 years, 1986 onwards, the short stay home or a halfway home called Asha. 
some other patients and families who got benefited by our programs, they stayed for a period of one or two years. And then when they went back home and the families found they were not maintaining their good amount of mental health and maintaining their self-worth living at home, they started functioning less than adequately. So the family members got together amongst themselves, talked to themselves and came and approached us and said, look, we have looked out for our children, brother and sister and son and daughter. Will you please take care of them, providing a long stay facility? We had no idea of doing that. So they were very persistent. 12 families joined together and said, please start a long stay home for these people. We are willing to put in money for you to run it. We give the money, you run the program because we do not know how to run the program. You have by then have a 10 year expertise of running a short stay home, half a home, so please help us. So we decided to offer this help. We got this money, they all put in at the time, I remember five lakhs. So they gave us about 60 lakhs of rupees and we said, please start this facility. So we bought a house. We bought this house, which you see on this left side. Fortunately, we had six rooms, three in the first floor, three in the ground floor. So we could have 12 patients, six men and six women in two different floors. And we thought we'll put the remaining money in the fixed deposit and run the show. But unfortunately, you know, the money dwindled in interest rates and we had to resort other methods of charging them fees to run the program. What are the objectives of a long stay facility? The home caters to those who have been treated earlier in our own halfway home. So there is one other criteria. We do not take in people who directly come to say, we want to join long stay home. We do not do that because we want to know who the client is, who the resident is, what are the strengths, what has been the illness, what has been the duration of the illness, what has been the pattern of improvement or recovery or where have they got stuck. And we know the families by then. We know the strength of the family. We know which family member is supportive, which family member may not be supportive. Unless we have this kind of a background knowledge and information, we did decide that we will not take them in. <clears throat> so every single person who is in our long stay home I have spent at least a year or two in the short stay home. And all patients are referred by respective psychiatrists. And I made it a point very clearly from the very beginning that I will not look after all the patients there. So every psychiatrist who refers them from within Bangalore city, outside Bangalore, sometimes outside the country, when they come from outside Bangalore, they have to locate a local psychiatrist for their further management because they need a local psychiatrist to monitor their medication. So, but say if you have 15 patients, there may be different psychiatrists who are like looking after them. Some of them are also my own patients. We teach them independent living skills, one of the objectives. We help them to find employment outside and they're taught appropriate vocational skills. What are the current profile of patients in our long stay home, which is called Jyoti? It can admit up to nine, 17 patients now. From there, <clears throat> from the original building, which you saw, we have moved to a different building. And about five years ago, you will see those pictures as we go along. And the age group is currently between 37 and 83. Remember, we started 25 years back. The 83 year old lady, uh, a lady from Punjab, all her four sisters are doctors. They're all in United States. And when she joined with us, she was about 57 or 58. And remember this 83 year old lady has been ill for over 55 years. She has a chronic schizophrenia of 55 years of illness. And the youngest is 37 who joined rather late. All of them are diagnosed with severe mental illness, predominantly with chronic schizophrenia or bipolar disease. Till date, 13 clients have been discharged in the last 26 years now, and they are functioning with minimal supervision at home. And the family, some of them are still in touch with us. A couple of them have passed away, including one about six months ago, suddenly died of a heart attack, a 73-year-old lady who had been ill for over 45 years, been with us for about eight to 12 years. Those who are presently staying at Jyoti manage the day-to-day -day activities with minimal supervision. If you come and if any of you come and see, you'll be surprised by the very high functioning level of our chronic mentally ill patients. Because of the kind of the program we run, 
they are very highly functional and several of our colleagues from abroad who have come from different parts of richmond fellowship programs from australia new zealand and uk and other places they are astonished to find the level of functionality with our um, residents due to age related concern constant supervision from the staff needs to happen because as they grow older a lot of comorbid medical conditions get to get to get latched on we have a excellent staff patient ratio for a 17 patients residents as we call them because they reside with us we have five professional staff the ratio is 5 to 17 which is 1 in 4 there are four support staff one cook and three helpers administrative decisions are taken by management which is a common administrative team that runs all the three programs daycare short stay home and a long stay home a common admin program the day to day management of the individual facilities half a home long stay home and the daycare center are handled by the respective staff team and if there are any admin issues they come to the admin team if there are any professional issues they come to senior professionals <clears throat> like myself and currently uh, the current ceo of dr aditya was a psychiatrist and a couple of other senior psychologists who are available to us all the time for any inputs the client concerns are attended to immediately if there is any concern because we are continuously monitored 24/7 so we do not allow anything to fester long within 24 hours any disturbance either interpersonal issues or relapsing symptoms are quickly looked into attended to and referred to the treating psychiatrist if that treating psychiatrist is unavailable immediately or if it is middle of the night because i am available to them 24/7 they the staff will contact me i will advise for a temporary period for them until they see the respective treating doctor <clears throat> what's the program structure we offer group individual and family therapy families are contacted every now and then families do come and go because we make it clear from the very beginning families cannot abandon them there they have to be in touch with the clients with the residents and the staff at least once in 2 3 months and they do get in touch with us they come and visit them they take them out for a short uh, stay outside take them home for a periodic visits community meetings planned recreation such as movie out lunch out and picnics that happen on a regular basis except during the covid times about which i will talk a little later occupational therapy vocational training like art and craft i will also show you some of the thing that they uh, they do it in their uh, rehab homes we have centers with us some of the previous speakers have been very kind enough to finish their topics early so i might just you know pouch on another 5 10 minutes extra if uh, avinash permits me social skills and money management skills are something which other people have talked about we make a very special emphasis on showing skill, training these people it's a group home long stay home it's a group home and people asked when we started we did not know how long we are going to stay we do not call it a permanent stay but we say the stay is indeterminate but eventually those who have come they have stayed because they have become well they are functioning well and the family members feel that they have been able to provide they have not been able to provide this kind of a structured life for them and they are happy to be with us and some other residents when they go home for a short break they plan to go for 2 3 weeks at the end of one week they say i want to go back to my home home is what jyoti home my home is jyoti i want to come back home it's a community of staff and clients we run on therapeutic community principles between 12 to 18 members we have 17 at this point in time we believe less than about 10 is not viable more than uh, you know 18 or 20 will become very unwieldy to manage to provide the kind of a a constant monitoring program that is required to look after them long stay home should not be an alternative institution but it should be a home it's a home where people peer group and everybody is supportive and they feel it's a part of a home where they live with great degree of comfort and and uh, engage in activities which happens in any family focus on active rehabilitation nobody is allowed to sit there and fester 
everybody has to be actively engaged in some kind of a rehab program either individually or in a group or in a vocational rehabilitation which are constantly monitored by the staff and it a uh, rehab center of long term facility cannot and should not become a retention center which is not active rehabilitation some of them become retention centers we must have a room of sufficient size we have two people in a room they have enough personal space they have their own beds they have their attached bathrooms and they have the table and a small table and a cupboard space to keep their personal items we have common dining kitchen area wash area and toilets are attached for everybody there is a common room for men and women and they have their own television program because women watch different kinds of tv program men generally watch sports and women watch soap operas music and dance program and they have uh, computers for them to use on on a regular basis and we used to have a computer instructor in our daycare center who actually is a recovered computer engineer a patient of mine on treatment she joined us as a uh, daycare boarder and then became a part time instructor and then later became a full time employee an excellent individual who taught basic computers and enjoy sending emails and looking at the google and learning things we give them magazines we have a library for them which we some of us provide our used books and libraries which they enjoy reading and maintaining it garden and outdoor play area and there's a large area we have outside where they are able to come and spend time and some of them of course they smoke they are not allowed to smoke inside their rooms they come outside in the garden area and smoke smoke they have a play area where they can play you know we play caroms or we play uh, chess or badminton or in the outside area <clears throat> staff in separate staff room and a separate therapy room for this emergency medical attention is provided whenever people have talked about it in the in the previous speakers there is any medical attention because as you know as they are growing older there are always injuries falls or um, you know breathing issues these things happen repeatedly and we have connected with two very good multi speciality nursing homes nearby where i am a consultant because i'm a consultant with them they know me very well so we have had no problem whatsoever taking them to these places even in the dead of the night and to <clears throat> take care of their medical or surgical needs we are we pay a lot of emphasis on hygiene the place has to be maintained clean and hygienically this is other i don't want to get into this detail but license to run must happen under mental health act 1987 now it is sorry i have not updated this mental health care act and it has to be obtained from pwd act i just learned recently reconfirmed that once you have got an act uh, license from mental health care act pwd act does not apply to our center we have a board of visitors legal documentation to safeguard the interests of the clients at the time of admission people have already spoken about it we take a legal document from the families that they consent to have their son or daughter whoever under our monitoring and management and they sign sign on a stamp paper and they have to appoint a legal guardian there are patient patients of us residents of outside of bangalore they come from different parts of the country but they have to have they have to identify a legal guardian who will take care of this person for the period they are with us it may be a, a parent if the parents are getting older they give the responsibility to a sibling and it is very important for us to know who the legal legally appointed guardian for these people proper referral we have an admission form and has to be filled in by the family member a documentation must be given by the family and a treating psychiatrist must refer the patient must say what the diagnosis is what are the comorbid conditions what are the allergy responses what are the previous treatment given what is the current treatment the patient is on and how frequently the treating willing doc treating doctor is willing to see this individual for follow up and also uh, if there is an emergency that happens psychiatric emergency where would that individual should be admitted this must be given consent by the treating doctor if there is a medical emergency where would the treating psychiatrist would wish us to admit that individual for medical management so these 
information, we take it well in advance. Client's consent is very important. And the consent form, both the family member and the client must sign. We do not have any unwilling patient with us. Everybody is a person who is willing to stay with us because they've already been with us for one or two years in the past. It's a question of shifting from one location to a different location because daycare center and other centers are um, the long stay home center are differently located about five kilometers from one to another. We have clear cut process and guidelines, medication adherence and the supervision. That's something which I want to tell you. I've been fortunate of being with Richmond Fellowship for the last 32 years. And I've given up my practice to be available with them practically, not practically, every single day. I visit the center every day. So I know every single patient. And even though they are not my patients, and I know their families. I know their strengths and weaknesses. Especially with the Jyoti Longstay Home, all 25 patients, I know their entire story. Their siblings, where are they working? What is the strength of the family? Siblings, children, parents, uncles, aunts, everybody I know individually at the personal level. And I have been monitoring and watching them grow. I have the advantage of seeing rehabilitation happening under our very nose over 25, over 30 plus years. And yet, under our nose, even though we monitor medication adherence, some patients, remember lack of insight is a part of the problem despite the longevity of the story. They can miss medic taking medication. They may keep it in the mouth and spill it out and not take it. And we have had relapses. We monitor medication adherence extremely closely. And yet relapses can happen. Client safety and interest is paramount. And of course, because of the amount of work we have put in over the years, and there are plenty of research opportunities, and we have also communicated our work in the journals. Admission and advisory committee, we have an admission and advisory committee which supervises the functioning of the uh, house, long stay home Jyoti house. And Dr. Shokumar is part of the uh, meeting today, is sitting with us, he's been asking questions with an associate professor of Psychiat uh, of psychiatry, working in psychiatric rehabilitation services at Nimans. He is currently the chairman. We make sure the chairman of the admission committee and the advisory committee is not anybody part of our own team. It has to be somebody from outside. So there is a external monitoring, external uh, watching that happens. This advisory admission committee has mental health professionals who are again from outside of our center. So usually we take people from Imant because we know them very well or St. John's Medical College or other medical institutions. Caregivers are those who are with us out of 17, that there are one or two caregivers who are part of this committee and they take, they come as a matter of rotation and their term is three years. Sometimes residents are, those who are with us, they have to come and give a, report during the committee about what they think has been happening in the last three years, what are their observations, what are their needs and requirements, which they can very frankly, openly talk to the committee members. Of course, our staff members are there. And we are also very clear in taking in members from the community nearby. We are living in a center, we are, our center is located in a well-known um, residential areas of Bangalore to make sure that the community am amongst us are also involved, we take in one or two members from our neighbors. We invite them, call them, take them around and say, please, can you be a member of the community? And we have been very fortunate um, having members from the neighborhood as a part of the committee. Clear understanding of the rules. We believe that it should not become a dumping ground. Medical consultant. Now, there is a medical consultant that is available across the building is a senior medical doctor who comes and helps us for any emergencies. If required, we take them for admission into the nearby hospital, as I said before. And every year we have an annual family meeting. All the family members have to compulsorily come for an annual family meeting. And till COVID time, it was a physical meeting. And now last year, because of the COVID issue, we had a virtual meeting where 
people from across the globe australia on one side uk on one side singapore on one side usa on another side and of course bangalore and outside bangalore everybody participated this year also we'll have it sometime in november that's the period we have and because majority of them are elderly population we as a matter of abundant caution uh, we do annual checkup for everybody women have to undergo mammography and because of which we found an early uh, carcinoma of breast in one of our patients who is now in her 70s she had a surgery and she is on a follow up so things are going well so we are able to pick up uh, metabolic issues diabetes um, cholesterol issues lipid issues and sometimes um, some minor cardiac events so one other lady had a lump in the breast and we have been continuously monitoring for the last 4 years and it is just an adenoma adenoma and it has not turned carcinogenic and it has been on a continuous monitoring because of this we are able to catch these things pretty early <clears throat> psychiatric medical emergencies you know um, you can never prevent a psychiatric emergency it can happen and for psychiatric emergencies patients are taken and admitted as per the recommending treating doctor medical emergencies as i have already mentioned uh, for a client sense of 10 to 15 we have at least two people in it for a day sometimes three people work at the day time one for a night duty compulsorily a lady house parent or a staff nurse trained professionals people have mentioned earlier we were fortunate to have a uh, training that is happening with us our own students who have passed who studied msc in psychosocial rehabilitation they are also working with us in our own center because they have already been trained by us all those people who come with either a uh, masters in psychiatry psychology psychiatric social worker although they have done this masters program they have not had any exposure uh, to psychiatric rehabilitation we have had people doing mphil in immense psychiatric social work and also psychology but the component of psychiatric rehabilitation that is taught to them during that course is not adequate so we train them we give them a crash course on managing these people with long term mental illness it is not a mere prayer for boarding and lodging therapeutic intervention structured lifestyle but it is flexible activity relaxation recreation personal hygiene and housekeeping is absolutely essential they take part in housekeeping along with the housekeeping staff money management and social skills some of you have already talked about it it's very important they have to manage their own money they run their bank account they can draw money and deposit money for what they get from the families we all know about how staff attitude can be uh, can have a positive impact it has to be care and concern and compassion understanding and tolerance and negative impact if their staff are authoritative if they are rude unyielding and competing i you do it because i say so i have no patience because don't come and disturb me now and they are very they can dig their heels and then they can be unyielding sometimes and they can be competing with the patients for challenging their notions and we do not encourage this we constantly monitor this and we provide support for the staff and making sure these things do not happen remember when they come to work with us fresh they have no idea how to handle people with this kind of a problems therefore they may make mistakes but people who have been working with them for long periods of time have to be patient enough to provide and we also run staff group programs from external group people who come and provide so that the uh, burnout issues are handled inter staff issues some of the staff sometime they may not get along with, uh, very well with each other it happens in any family there are 10 people 8 to 10 people in the family two other people are rubbing with each other so these issues if they come up we need to identify that so that it does not impact the patients residents because it will happen sometimes very important to have linkage with the government be part of the government program be friending in involving neighbors i have already mentioned to you disability certificate and benefits we make sure that they all of them have disability certificate uh, we get the disability certificate uh, done at nimhans they all have the the 40% disability from idea scale is uh, 
monitored for them. Lies with the Department of Women and Child Welfare, Disability Commissioner in Department of Health. We have a good rapport with these departments to help us of our need for the benefit of patients. Community-based agency, other NGOs, we are pretty well connected with other NGOs working in Imans, sorry, working in Bangalore. We could do better, but we are better than many other places. What do family wants? What do the what does the family want when they come with their patient? They want a structured life and skills training. Caregivers are tired and exhausted, not able to manage them at home. They feel we are able to monitor them better, provide help for them better. They also are getting respite, support and self-help group for the families. They do not want, some families want custodial care, but they don't want to look after them. They don't want to come and see them again. We discourage such people. We say, people have told us we are coming to put our daughter here because we are migrating to United States. This happened about 15 years ago. And doesn't matter whatever is the amount you want, we'll give you. We tell them sorry, unless you are keen on being part of a training, part of a rehabilitation plan and management with us, we don't think we are keen on keeping such people. And monetary issue is not important to us, but being part of a being partner in caring is very important. Family involvement should be from the very beginning. Psychoeducation for the families periodically. They are partners in caring. Telemate for each individual. Very essential to have structured and periodic meetings. What are the issues and challenges? Comorbid physical ailment as age advances. I must confess when we started it, when I was very enthusiastic in starting this program 26 years ago, we did not anticipate that people will age. Of course they did. We should have thought of it. And we did not think many of them have will end up with comorbid issues, which they have. I think at our last count, 15 out of 17 people have comorbid physical ailments. And they're all continuously being monitored, not only by the psychiatrists, by the physicians, orthopedicians, uh, pulmonologists, and uh, cardiologists, what have you. Monitoring, managing psychiatric medical emergencies, maintaining personal boundaries, especially the opposite sex. And now sometimes this happens, it's a mixed community. And they're all young people living with their 30s and 40s and 50s. Issues of, you know, closeness, emotional closeness, sometimes, uh, you know, boundaries may get crossed. We constantly monitor that and we keep talking about maintaining personal boundaries, especially the opposite sex, not only between patients, staff and patients, and very soon we are going to introduce the POSH Act into our center, which becomes very essential when we have a mixed population of men, women, staff, men and women, clients, patients, men and women. So this POSH Act becomes very important and we are going to introduce it very soon. Staff transition burnout, people already talked about it. When we get young staff beginning to work with us, they come and work for one or two years, as Ronnie mentioned earlier, we provide the kind of support and training, but they move on because they want to join IMAX, they want to join IMFIL, they want to join PhD in uh, psychiatric rehabilitation. They get married and they want to go abroad and a work exposure to Richmond Fellowship two or three years. Many of them have moved to UK, Ireland and uh, United States. Fortunately, our training and support, exposure and certificates seem to have provided the kind of a benefit they want when they want to work abroad. Long stay home during COVID, a quick line. Majority from other states of India, stress and anxiety, some of them make, became very dysfunctional. Some others were very comfortable and calm. They were worried the virus may reach them through vegetables, couriers. They said, you know, we have to sanitize them. We have to sanitize the courier. We have to sanitize the, uh, you know, the boxes. Vegetables have to be done needed repeated reassurances. We provided them with report, uh, repeated support meetings. Some of them, in fact, one patient got so panicky, she called the police, she called the city corporation and said, we are having problems here, please come and visit us. So we had to call them and tell them, this is the center, that's what we are doing. And they were reassured after they came and visited us. And during the, from the time COVID started 2020, March, 
we have not permitted them to step out of the premises it may sound rather rude but i think we needed survival more than anything else so they have not been allowed to go out everything and anything they wanted are brought by staff including their personal belongings clothes inner wear if necessary shoes belts whatever they want they go and buy and come they are not allowed to go out because we do not want them exposed and all of them have been double vaccinated including the 83 year old um, patient with chronic schizophrenia what are the seven principles i am very fond of this slide whenever we work with a mental health issue especially in we have if a person is not responding very well i always say go back and reassess have you missed anything people come to us with a different diagnosis referred by different doctors we make our own assessment people say this is personality disorder but we find they are schizophrenia people say this is schizophrenia but there are borderline personality disorders land up with us so we reassess if there is a problem in not doing well reassess reset our goals rehabilitation goals we can plan at the beginning at midpoint and as we go along but keep resetting goals because the goals will not match your expectation or the family's expectation be realistic we must reduce expectation because families think when the minute they come and deposit them with you you be surprised when they come with 10 years of illness two three treatments in the past ask them do you know the diagnosis they don't know the diagnosis do you know what the prognosis they don't know what the prognosis is it's surprising so we need to tell them just because you come here don't expect that your person will become completely all right we will do our best we'll be we are very pleased to see the resilience exhibited by the patients and the families we thought this may not work but the resilience that we notice in them has been a good learning for us reassure us and support the family and client and staff recovery is not instant in the period of instant um, gratifications quickly renew your virtual tour this is the current center we have this is the entrance this is the puja when we had we entered the building about 5 years ago this are the common area this is a female common area this is a men's common area as you know notice rohit sharma from mumbai is batting very well there this is the rooms attached to bathroom two beds and is a common dining area exercise cycle exercise cycle there this is a veranda outside space where they sit and smoke or they put their clothes for drying it's a journey rehabilitation is a journey it's an ongoing process the journey that is undertaken by different stakeholders they are the patients the residents patients as we call them family members and the core passengers who are the core passengers you and i are the core passengers they are stops on the way at time the stops can be unexpected and the stop can be longer than you thought may move on on a wrong track some derailments can happen but give everyone a chance to grow everyone a chance to get better importantly do not ever give up three things what you must have when you work with patients with mental illness especially for rehab care commitment and compassion to me i would rather have a compassionate staff than a person who is a brilliant gold medalist who is very hard hearted i have actually given up such uh, a, a brilliant student brilliant person but compassion is not there so compassion is very important are you able to lean over and then hold a hand over somebody figuratively when a person is going through an emotional distress are you there ownership to me it's very important whatever job you do you need to take ownership if you don't take ownership of anything that you do if you think your job is 9 to 5 and you go back and you don't own you don't feel ownership issues with the work that you do then the outcome is not likely to be uh, satisfactory it's a journey where we are all taking part and this is my favorite slide i want to show you a one minute clip oh sorry
ladies and gentlemen uh if the the clip i showed you is a true story a story narrated to me by a family member from kenya where i had gone to see a patient long ago it happened in zanzibar the last point the young man makes to his friend who has come to visit him after 30 years being in the united states he says i want to come and meet my old friend with whom we played we climbed trees we had pranks together at 15 the boy gets admitted in the mental asylum in zanzibar the family abandoned him and went because they were stigmatized this doctor a friend who became a doctor in usa went to meet him and said after spending some time he asked him any message this is what every single patient asks are asking they may not articulate this what did i deserve why did i deserve to become sick they didn't ask for it but we as mental health professionals have to be there to see that we provide the best for them so i i am very fond of this robust frost when i took on psychosocial rehab or psychiatric rehab i took the less i took the one less traveled two roads diverged in a low wood blah 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 i took the low um, road that is less traveled by and i have never regretted even once because my passion when i did psychiatry was neurology when i did my undergraduate my passion was cardiology when i did when i was teaching in imans i was very fond of psychopharmacology and neuropsychiatry but all of them have come in handy for this i came to see richmond fellowship 32 years ago i came i saw and i was conquered i think i end the story here if you have 3 minutes i will quickly run through the various craft item they make i will simply these are the things that the clients have made sitting in their long stay jyoti home painting done by patients which has won awards thank you very much for your time and um, thanks avinash i took advantage of this additional time that was given by my friends in the previous speakers thank you very much well uh, thank you very much sir there are a few questions one is um um when we admit patients to a long term home what do we do if patients relatives are old and pass away and there's no other family excellent question sir we have we are uh, asking them to form a trust they form a trust and uh, we take legal opinion and this has been discussed with the family members repeatedly when they come for the family meetings and it is likely to happen sometime because there are op- parents die siblings may may not be there to provide support so we form it ask them to form a trust and the trust will take care of their income and money is being coming from the trust to the center for their upkeep uh and the trustees are as per the recommendation by the our legal team okay uh sir has the increase in the recent increase in a consumeristic attitude of caregivers impacted long term rehabilitation uh can i be more specific what is consumeristic activity probably i think more more money mindedness and you know the compassionate part not being there you know <laughs> very tricky question yes i i believe that is why i said repeatedly rehab it's a rehabilitation center it cannot be a retention center because sometimes family members um, i just the other day i was talking to somebody they had put a patient in some center across some place and when the family members wanted to go and visit them they were not permitted to visit them and this kind of a uh, so someone has just written that consumeristic attitude they meant was getting what they pay for ah okay yeah. 
Are yeah. they getting what they are paying for? Yeah. I think so because they are very happy with what the work we are doing with their family members, and they are very happy that we are taking care of them. We are very happy that they are in a highly high functioning state they are living in despite several years of illness, which they were unable to manage at home for 10, 15 years. Yes, they are. Yes, we are very satisfied. This is the feedback we have from them. Uh, sir, has there been any loss of learned skills in your patients due to the restrictions imposed by COVID? Good question. Uh, we continuously monitor and provide the kind of skills they need morning till evening over a structured lifestyle, structured program. The skills that they would have loved to have done, which they, have, they may not have done in the last 18 months is going out shopping on their own. They all go for a movie together. They all go for what they call a lunch out together. Once a month, we give them an option. This is the budget. And you choose where you want to go and eat, what you want to go and eat. So we book the room in the restaurant in advance. Now, uh, they're losing out on all of that. And going out and seeing the city outside, which they'd love to walk around. Unfortunately, we are not able to do that. And we are not taking any chances. I must tell you here, despite all our precautions, uh, three patients were COVID positive. One needed to be hospitalized. One patient being local went home, home quarantined. Two of them had to be quarantined within our own premises because we had a daycare center where our room was large enough to be monitored. So our staff wearing PPE kits monitored the treatment for two weeks and then they, they had to come back. And a couple of staff also became positive because it is very, very difficult to, as other speakers had mentioned, to make sure that they don't get exposure at all, despite restrictions, because you do not know where they are coming from. So, right. yeah. Uh, so, do you need to have mandatorily a 24 hour RMO in the center? 24 hour RMO? Uh, yeah. No, we don't believe you don't. You need a 24 hour RMO. Our staff are well trained to, in fact, they give medication as per the prescription given by them. They are taught how to understand. I take classes for them. And if they have any medical problem, they immediately contact the doctor across or contact me and advise them what to do. In the premises, we have not felt the need to have an RMO, but the medical doctor availability on call is important, very important. Right. And uh, uh, one minute. Uh... No, it's not. There's not. This is a question that I wanted to ask. That you know, particularly sure. like we see in uh, adolescent homes or even orphanages or care homes for you know a lot of people. You're you're having patients who are uh, in this facility for years together. So do we see like you know a personal rivalry or fight? So you know, I mean, oh, those sure. kind of things between oh, the patients, oh. like we see in a family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course, it's a family. Like in a family, there are rivalry. Yes. There are favoritism. There are people say, no, you have not given me time. Yesterday I wanted to talk to you. You didn't give me, but you favored somebody else. You know, this can right. happen. And unfortunately, as in psychiatry, if these things happen, it can result in a relapsing of symptoms. Some paranoid ideas peeping in. Correct. Or seeping inside. And these things happen despite medication. So if you're watching all of this, so that is why constant monitoring very true. In a very large, it's a extended family, a large family, a joint family, right. 25 people living there. There are bound to be rubs. And right. we're watching it. Yes, of course. Yeah. Do you all have a psychiatric nurse at the center? Someone has asked. Yes, it's a good question. We have been trying to get a psychiatric nurse. It has been recommended very strongly by our group. And the next appointment will be psychiatric nurse, which will happen very soon. Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, that's... Uh, all the questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Our last speaker, of course, Dr. Kumawat, couldn't be here because of another engagement. But beyond that, uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, joining us all the way from Bangalore, virtually. Thank you to uh, uh, Amar Shinde and uh, Ronnie from Pune, and of course, Fabian and uh, um, Anita, madam, from Mumbai. Uh, well, uh, the, the thing is, we are coming to the end of our CME. Uh, I don't know if Amar and Rani are still with us. Please keep your cameras on if you all are there. Uh, we want to click a good photograph of all of you all smiling as we are, you know, uh, uh, looking at uh, 
rehab so priyanka i think you will have to do the honors or and uh, just take that screenshot uh, amar i don't know he isn't there but uh, anyway uh, those of us who are here uh and even those who are attending can put their cameras on if they want yeah, it's, know, not that, not? it's not why that it's not that it's not that we don't uh, you know want you all to be in the frame so that's also uh, fine and uh, we'll just have this photo yes um uh, thank you avinash and bts yeah. for giving this opportunity to share our knowledge and information of learning a lot over these years and a special thanks to bps for inviting me to be part of them very very happy for that right. yeah priyanka amar is also here you can just click that photo so that it's there for the record so uh, yeah. once the recording is ready will you be able to share it with us yes so yes so we we'll definitely okay. send you the recording Yeah. Uh, I have two announcements to make. That one is the next event is on the twenty first. That is Wednesday, and uh, it's a collaboration with the Indian Psychiatric Society School Mental Health Task Force, and uh, we're going to have a debate on online education, whether it's good or bad, versus, uh, and then following that up with a panel discussion, which has all sorts of mental health professionals uh, on it. Uh, the maybe you might invite a young so. Young student also to. So we are trying. We are trying to do that. We are trying to do that. So my that grandson who's sitting thing. next to me is very happy to be part of that. Uh, <laughs> no, definitely. Then we will definitely. I'll I'll get in touch with you soon. There he is. So yes, yes. Uh, yeah, there I'll is. get in touch with you <laughs> soon. So definitely. So that's there. And uh, on the twenty seventh, which is a Tuesday in the afternoon, we have the clinical meeting of KM Hospital at two pm. We'll get back to you with further details on that. Over to you, Priyanka, for the uh, vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, especially Dr. Fabian, Dr. Ranita, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amar Shinde, Roni, and uh, Dr. Kalyan Sundaram for spend, uh, sparing the time on a Sunday evening. And uh, we had a great uh, involvement by all the participants because the questions kept on flowing, and uh, it has been highly appreciated. I am glad that we could hear you people out, especially the youngsters who are entering the branch of psychiatry now and. are graduating it's a i think it's a privilege for all of us to hear you people out and uh, know where people who want to open rehabs where to contact whom to contact for that so i thank you everyone on behalf of bps for uh, such an amazing uh, program and i thank our uh, dr vinash this is also because he's the most active one in the bps <laughs> to have a program to decide such programs so sir to hamesha bolte ki मुझे एडीएचडी है तो अभी पूरा बीपीएस को भी एडीएचडी रहेगा वी ऑल विल बी एक्टिव थ्रू आउट द ईयर बट आई थिंक इट्स हेल्पिंग अस ऑल अ लॉट एंड वी ऑल एंजॉय इट थैंक यू सो मच एवरीवन थैंक यू ऑल या थैंक यू इट्स बीन अ वंडरफुल लर्निंग फॉर ऑल ऑल ऑफ अस सर थैंक यू यस थैंक यू थैंक यू यस यू कैन गो बैक टू वाचिंग क्रिकेट और द गोल्फ फाइनल डे और द ओपन Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you my numbers have changed i will connect via avinash to you back again yeah yeah please do yes. please do good to yeah. get in touch with all of you good to sure. make new see yes. new faces and i'm very very happy to be part of that sure thank you great evening virtual